All right, I asked to send videos of ones you want me to react to, and here's Robert Kiyosaki video that got sent to me. I'll be watching it as I go through and make my commentary for the very first time. Uh, he and I have done a couple interviews together. I've been on his podcast a few times. Rich Dad Poured Out it was a book that absolutely changed my paradigm as I was coming out of college and read it and absolutely loved it. So we'll see. There's a little caveat there. We don't see eye to eye on everything. Uh, he's on the very pessimistic side of things right now. And in some ways, I agree on others. I would do things a little bit differently. So here you go with my reaction. Rich Dad Poor Dad savers are losers because they save this. But I'd rather save this because this will be here 10,000 years from now. This won't. You know, you can pass it on for generation to generation to generation. I'll be surprised if that paper dollar is here even 10 years from now. I doubt it, yeah. So anyway, we're, we're in very serious, serious trouble here. And uh, this is the hottest subject going. For years I've been saying buy silver because everybody can afford silver. <laughs> I definitely have some silvers in the hedge. It is a very volatile market because when major institutions decide to buy or sell, it moves quite a bit. And it also moves heavily during have, during times where people are heavily skeptical of the financial institutions. And I'm here to say uh, over 50% of the banks have problems in the United States right now. Many of those are insolvent. And those are the ones that we know about if people want to go get their money out. We've seen the collapse of three major banks with plenty of money taking $36 billion of the FDIC's $123 billion. So yeah, I think that, that I'm concerned with, with money that is sitting in a bank. I'd rather own assets. Silver is one that I don't own a huge amount of, but I do have some, so let's keep listening. Those for three bucks, they went nuts. Why would I buy that? Because I'd rather have this. That's the lesson. I'm one of the few people who absolutely despise cash for buying gold and you'd think just the opposite that I couldn't wait to get cash but banks don't want it try and deposit 20 or 50 thousand dollars in cash they'll turn you away and say well we got to do this that and the other and uh we've got to yeah once I had this uh these clients that I said why don't you withdraw 75 thousand dollars from your bank for your event and just put it in a briefcase in the middle of the room and don't say anything about it and just see how people interact as they go about it they had to go multiple days to multiple institutions sign off when they took more than a certain amount. I think the most any institution let them take was 10,000 and one of them had a $3,500 limit on the amount of cash they would give, which is kind of crazy on the withdrawal side. He's saying just depositing actual cash has its issues as well. This form, we gotta do that. I, I would rather have a bank wire than cash anytime. But you know what else? I'm thinking- Yeah, so they're talking about actual physical cash, which you know, it's, you're not earning interest on that and stuff like that. Uh, silver versus cash, I mean, you know, the cash is a little bit more liquid, but silver is fairly liquid. It's just a little bit more volatile, but it has more upside potential for sure, considering quantitative easing and how much cash has just been flooded in the market. And, you know, what are you going to do with a bunch of paper? Let's say I acquire a million or $2 million in cash that the banks don't want to take. When this currency is repudiated, I'm going to be stuck, just like the people in Germany were twice in the 20th century. That is interesting that like when the Mexico peso crisis happened, like how fast that devalued or in Zimbabwe, I have a, a billion dollar note from Zimbabwe because of how quickly it inflated. Because it's what happens when governments get involved and you know, they just start adding with the Federal Reserve from the United States, just printing money through quantitative easing. It's devaluing that money. That the, the, they were hauling wheelbarrows full of uh, yeah, there's stories in Russia, too, where people are hauling wheelbarrows of cash. People would knock over the wheelbarrow and take the wheelbarrow and leave the cash behind. For a basket of groceries. And, and that's when fake money brought Hitler to power. Every time there's fake money, tyrants rise up because people know something is wrong. And I've talked to people all the time that, have, that are multimillionaires. They sold their business. They did this, that, and the other. And... I came into all this cash that's sitting in the bank and said, well, you think I should buy some gold with some of this? I said, well, you know what they're doing, the dollar. You know that they keep print, printing them. They can't print gold. Now, we are in an interesting place where quantitative easing was putting money in, and now there's quantitative tightening where the Fed is taking money back through some of the structure. So uh, I, I'm not... I'm just not that guy that gets overly excited about gold and silver. I'm not excited about the dollar either. 
I want assets that have utilization. Now, silver can be very, you know, functional. Gold can be very functional. And a lot of the things that are made, you know, um, th there's, there's plenty there. But as a currency, I use it more as a hedge, not as what I really want, because I want cash flow. I want things that I'm aligned with my investor DNA. What do I know a lot about? Intellectual property and content creation and speaking and you know, those kind of factors or businesses that I'm directly involved in that I have influence over. So I, I, it's not something that I'm sitting there going, well, the, the dollar's going to collapse. The dollar's been devalued for long periods of time. We went to a fiat currency and moved away from the gold standard. We moved into central banking and the way, how we know it now in the late, you know, in the early 1900s, I think it was 1913. And so that's created some of this inflation, which loses purchasing power on the dollar. We've had these conversations uh, from Robert for a long time about this collapse. And maybe, you know, one day he'll be right because it just seems like what we've done with quantitative easing and everything that happened during the pandemic, we sure did accelerate some of these problems and now raising the interest rates on after flooding the money, uh, the market with money and saying interest rates is what's going to help bring down inflation. Well, maybe it's that we printed too much money and that's where part of the problem is and why people are looking to silver now. You tell me how much you can afford to lose of all that money sitting in the bank and I would say leave that there and get the rest of it in gold. It's a bigger risk. Having Again, people, people go for gold during difficult times and it goes up and down. It's just a lot of the people that are the most pessimistic go towards gold. But again, I'm thinking like, what utility does it have if they're right and times are that disparate and they're that despondent and they're that, you know, problematic. So um, I look at it more, again, as a hedge, not as my main investment. I want cash flow. And I, I you know, even I'm more of a Bitcoin guy over gold at this point because it's easy to move. It's on an open database where all the transactions are validated and there's a the finite amount that's going to happen that makes it more deflationary than what the dollar might be. We have a lot of volatility in it at this point. There's still tons of speculation. It's still really new and, and kind of came out after the banking crisis of 2008. So it's still going to be a wild ride. But but I like that you know money has nine main properties when we're talking about money in the banking system where Bitcoin has 11 properties. And it's just like if you've tried to send, send a wire anytime recently, this is a lot easier for me to transfer Bitcoin over and I can have a hard wallet. I can have my 24 words that help me access it from wherever I'm at, where I have internet. So there's, you know, I just like that system a whole lot better. I know people kind of refer to that as digital gold because it, it does, it's just an easier way to do transactions. And I think there's a long way to go to where it will be and being something that has transactional value because of the stories of, because of the run up in price or that it comes back down or all of that, it's going to be a wild ride, but I'm more on that bandwagon than I am this one. In paper money, it's a guaranteed, it's it's a guaranteed loss. And, and eventually, these are going to be worthless. And we're in the 51st year of fiat money when Nixon closed the gold window. A currency has never lasted more than 50 years until now. And we're in year 51. Look at their... And part of that's just, I think, because of how many people are have used the dollar and we're in a much more global economy, but there, you know, there are some pretty valid arguments to consider here, especially as you see, they're about to talk about Venezuela that really just decimated their, their monetary system. They were one of the richest countries in the, uh, in South America and, and actually the Western hemisphere. Look what they've done to Argentina. Look what they've done in Cuba. Look what they've done in Mexico. They had the same exact economic principles that they broke there. Vote yourself into the treasury. That's a big part of it with these governments. Same thing here. Some, somebody asked me once, how many, Charles, how many paper currencies have gone uh, broke, gone <laughs> worthless over time? And the answer is all of them. All of them. And the, the, ones that, the ones that people. And what's great is if you, there's a book I love, The Ascent of Money, A-S-C-E-N-T. It's actually behind me there. I mean, it talks about the history of money and what happens. And I'm here to tell you, even coin systems lost massive value so, you know, this might be a temporary solution. I don't see it being the permanent solution here. Still older, only on their way. They just haven't arrived at their final destination yet. It's like I'm 17 years old in 1964 going, something's wrong here. And that's Gresham's <laughs> law. And I, I think that's one of the reasons I'm a rich person is I know real from fake. <laughs> and then, so when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard in 71, 
I didn't really know what that meant, but the first course, I, this was, I was in Vietnam in 73, I came back. 70. And I even feel like the Federal Reserve taking over and being the central banks with our money system in 1913 was a predecessor that created problems, probably even worse than leaving the gold standard because we were already doing fractionalized banking where we're having a dollar be spent more than once as it, as it goes through the banking system and there's only a percentage of reserve requirement and then it moves back to the next account and someone else is using it, but it was really this other person's dollar. I mean, that's something that I've done other videos on, but that's that's a big issue too. Or they made this legal. Remember that? It was illegal. So I had to smuggle that damn crew. I wasn't... Yeah, because they actually went in the early 1900s sometime door to door and started taking back people's gold and buying it from them. I think it was like in FDR's years, which is kind of wild to think. Hong Kong and the buying the Kruger and <laughs> South African Kruger and in Hong Kong. I had to smuggle it into the country. Why was that? In se it was in 74. Yeah. yeah, because it was Ill illegal to own in bullion form. And well, if the they they about it, in some yeah, it, it was a it. felony. It was a felony. They they could put you in prison for 10 years and charge you $10,000 fine. They made it a felony for Americans, free people, to own monetary gold and silver. This is why your investor DNA matters. This is why investing in yourself and your skill sets. This is why having the ability to have enough cash flow to cover your expenses, even if you don't show up to do work the next day, is really going to matter in that financial independence. And I do think it's smart to have certain things like, you know, I, I personally, I know how to hunt. I know we have a river that we're on where we could fish. If there's a disruption in the supply of food, because we had the biggest winter on record in Utah and that we, we handled it pretty well. But when Austin, Texas, the year before had a winter issue, they didn't handle it very well. And people really struggled. And just when people are struggling to survive, gold isn't really going to matter that much. And, you know, I don't know that I want to be around for that type of a world anyway, necessarily, but but I do think having some basics handled where we learn certain skill sets that we've forgotten because of big city living is actually really helpful. It gives us an appreciation for what it takes to provide food, whether it's someone that's gardening or whether it's someone that's hunting. You know, by having some food reserves, that could be really essential or knowing some basics about anything that allows you to provide for yourself if money starts to you know, lose its value in a massive way. Yeah. Or gold, anyway. It was a, it was a felony. How they, it was a day. And this, I mean, look, this talking about felony and all this, I, this is kind of got a negative tone. And I really think that we could focus on what are our steps that we could take today to increase our value, to recognize our value, to add more value to other people, to increase our financial literacy, our ability and knowledge to be more productive and a better service. And there's major problems out there. Pointing out the problem is one thing. Just buying gold or silver isn't the solution. It's your sole purpose. It's who you are in the world and how you show up. It's the relationships that you build and the value you have within those relationships is learning how to handle certain basics that we've long forgotten so that you are more self-reliant responsibility and self-reliance are going to be the keys for the future. Silver is a very, very small speck of what is really going to matter in this kind of despondent future they're talking about. Was it going to blow up? Was it nuclear contamination? Was it kill your neighbors with poison? What, what was wrong? Well, was, of course, you know the answer. It's always the same answer. The government grabs all the gold because it wants it for itself, so you can't be allowed to have any. And this was 850. What, what is this today? Uh, 2050. So why would you save this trash? <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I'm saying here. Well, 850 in 1974 and in, you know, 2022 or whenever this video, 21, 20, like that's not a great return. I mean, when we look at what inflation has done over that period of time, what I think is important is what can you do to expand your means? What can you do to be of more value? What can you do to find your purpose, what your values, what your passions and abilities are to bring that to the vision of the world so that you can get paid in a very uh, profound way for the impact that you make? And if we think more about impact than letting fear get us into a place where we're just hoarding something like silver, I think that's going to be a better solution. And Robert's one of those people that has added massive value through his books, so many good books that he's put out there. You know, um, so I would just look at this as such a small fraction of what you do to protect and preserve your wealth. It's fake How about that to sum it up. That's fake. It's a trick. This is the biggest reason. It's fake. I mean, like this—that's not a profound statement. But he was really proud of. You want to own gold? 
because our pensions, you know, as we keep raising interest rates, our 401ks are going down. But not only this, it's my, my book, Road to Ed, Ed Sedell, it's our pensions are broke. So it's the firefighters, police officers, school teachers, their pensions are gone. So the Fed's going to have to print. That's yeah, this is the problem with that, you know, they're, they're expecting too high of an interest rate from the market when it doesn't perform. And they've got these pensions and people are no longer working. There's a book called The Fate of the States. Um, and inside of that, it talked about how people were leaving states that were taxing really high. And therefore, these states and places within the states had all these obligations to pay pensions, but were losing tax revenue because people would then leave once they retired to a place where it was less expensive, like people exiting California, and even states competing with other states to say, we're not going to charge you any state tax for 10 years if you move here. And then all their kind of free money that they had that they would normally use to build infrastructure or pay police officers or fire fighters was going to pensions because they had a higher priority than over the actual workers. And they were placed like there were definitely places where they were only responding if the crime was in process, if it already happened, they didn't have capacity in Stockton, California, as one example. So, so, you know, we have to think about our ideas have consequences and we'll remove value as the main conduit for how things happen. Then we stop exchanging with one another. We pro stop providing, and government policy cannot hold up the results. It requires individuals and people. And if we get into a place where it feels more like socialism or communism of redistribution to help people who are not actually, you know, capable of doing much, and then we rob from the people who are, what we have to do is invest in people so that we all have more capability. Support one another, not with bad policy but with providing the tools and resources and know-how and knowledge that says you are valuable, you have to learn that value and bring it to the world. Silver's not going to solve that either. That's my whole summation. Well, and what's what's crazy about it too is that you get your statement online every month and it says, oh my God, look, I have $500,000 in my pension plan. Boy, that's going to last me until um, the year uh, 2050. It's not going to. The dollar's not going to be there first of all, and the pensions are gone too. But gold will be there this forever. Be here. This is God's money. I mean, they with gold and silver. I mean, what's the value going to be? Again, we're talking about eight hundred and fifty dollars in nineteen seventy four, growing to like you know whatever it was twenty fifty, two thousand five hundred, whatever it was. I mean, like that. That's great until we look at inflation and how much eight hundred and fifty dollars or you know is worth today. And what that does that 2000, whatever that it's, would it even spend any different than if you would have spent it back then because of inflation again, cash flow, which is Robert's, he beats the drum of get assets to create cash flow. Mine is increase your skill set so that you could earn more, expand your means, add more value, solve more problems. Use this as a hedge, not as your key. Years, but God put it here on the earth. When you read the stories about all the Spanish ships that have sunk over the years coming across the Atlantic. And the explorers go down there. They're not going down there looking for the currency of the realm of the day and see if the paper survived. They're going down there looking for the gold. They're going yeah. there looking for the silver. And they find it. And what's amazing is that if this bar had been in the bottom of the ocean for 500 years, it'll still be in this pristine condition. Right. It doesn't rust. It doesn't erode. It it's still only a representation of value unless there's utilization. Yes. Does it have, you know, qualities that paper money is not going to have? But the question is, who's going to value it based upon the times If the money completely, if our economic system completely collapses, I don't think silver is going to solve your problems. Who's going to add that value? And why would they add that value in exchange for silver if they wouldn't do it for a dollar? Same thing now, 500 years later. Ron Paul, he says the difference between us, if, if a Spanish ship went down with gold, if a Spanish ship went down with dollars, people would stop diving for dollars. <laughs> they still dive for gold. And uh, it's, it's kind of a funny thing. All right. So message, invest in yourself, expand your means, discover and expose your skill sets in a way that you can add value, serve others, solve problems, have a small hedge here, but this isn't your whole solution. And don't just set money in the banks and hope it's going to work out and just trust FDIC because that's not the answer either. It's about building your investment portfolio with real assets, including whether that's intellectual property, whether that's real property, like you've got to look at these things that help you deal with inflation. Hey, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. And if you're enjoying these videos, well, there's good news. More where that came from. So go ahead and click through and watch the next video now.